Hello, my friends. Welcome to my corner. There are many books that I cherish and that I treasure from my collection, and this is one of them. It is titled In the Shade of Spring Leaves, and it features a biography and nine stories by Ichio Higuchi, edited by translator and editor Richard Lyons Danley. Your question, Jorge, what is it about that book? Why is it so important to you? I would say In the Shade of Spring Leaves is a window into the life and the work of a Japanese author that is, to me, criminally underrated. So what I want to do today is I want to share with you some ideas on the life and the work of Ichio Higuchi, a Japanese author who basically stands between the classical tradition and the modern period of literature. So let me tell you first a little bit about the book itself. This is the only material that we have in English on and by Ichio Higuchi. So that's why it is also a very important book. And the editor and translator, Richard Lyon Stanley, published this in the early 80s, 1982. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1997 at the age of 50. So what we have here is, as I said before, biography and also uh, some of the works by Ichio Higuchi. So the biography section covers 164 pages of this book, so you're looking at this part right here. Then in the middle you have some photographs and some pictures, some images. And then the second half of the book, which amounts to, I would say, some 130 pages, consists of those nine stories that are included here. The rest is uh, lots of notes, very good ones, and also a very detailed index that you get here with this edition. I personally am not a huge biography person, so when I bought the book, I was like, wow, why can't I just have the stories? You know, I wish I, had, I just had the stories, because if there is a part of the book that deals with her biography, I'm going to feel, I don't want to say forced, but, you know, I, I'm going to feel pressured into reading that too, because otherwise I feel like I have not read the entire book. But let me tell you, after I read this book, the entirety of it, I was really happy about that biographical section that it has at first because you can see how her life you know and the events that she lived really you know provided a lot of material for her short stories and here's another thing that part the biography of Ichio Higuchi also includes plenty of material from her diaries and from other stories that are not included here so it's really a wonderful combination that we have in this book so Ichio Higuchi uh, did not live very long okay unfortunately she was born in 1872 and she died 24 years later only because she had tuberculosis so it's a really sad story in that sense because you have to wonder what else would she have accomplished if she had gotten the chance to do that but unfortunately that was her brief life she wrote 21 stories so here you get nine of them almost 4,000 poems, okay, some essays and then a really voluminous diary, some parts of which, as I said before, are included here. And here's the thing, she decided to title that diary In the Shade of Spring Leaves, so that's why we have this title right here. Now, this is not her diary, so that's important to distinguish that right there. Needless to say, this need hardly be mentioned she was influenced by the classics, okay, so the tale of Genji, um, the pillow book, the tales of Ise, and many more. It, it goes without saying in this time period in Japanese literature. And she came from a rural family that at one point moved to the city. So throughout her life she was very conscious of class differences, especially when she began to go to school. She noticed that her classmates were much better off, you know, much wealthier than she was because she was quite poor throughout her life. But at the same time, she was a lot more talented than her classmates and that really gave her an advantage. When she was young, she fell in love or became infatuated with a guy by the name of Tosui Nakarai. And she chose this guy who was an author as her mentor. He had a literary magazine, a journal. So she chose this guy as a mentor. And what Dan Lee says in the biographical section of this book is that that was kind of not a very good move on her part. Had she chosen another mentor from that time period, she might have gotten much farther in her literary career, but there were those feelings involved. Unfortunately, um, 
you know, uh, Ichio Higuchi and Tosui Nakarai were not really ever going to be a couple, okay? They were, I would say, star-crossed lovers. But that situation, that unrequited love that she felt for him, really provided a lot of material for her fiction. And you're going to see that if you read the stories in this collection. Right before she began to publish, this is very important, the novel Ukigumo, or Floating, Cra uh, Floating Cloud, was uh, published. Okay, so this is what is considered to be today the first modern Japanese work of fiction, or at least the first modern Japanese novel by Shimei Futabate. So all of the writers of that time, including Ichio Higuchi, were just, you know, unavoidably um, influenced by this first modern Japanese novel. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind. And then at her uh, early 20s, in her early 20s comes a period of very important changes for her. There's a turning point in her life right here because she moved with her mother and her sister, her father had already passed away, to a place that was very close to the pleasure quarter. Okay, this is very important because it's also going to provide a lot of material for her short stories. Another important thing that happens, and this one not so much in her life, but in her literary life or her literary career, is the influence of Ihara Saikaku. This was a 17th century Japanese writer, but in this moment in her life there was a revival. There was renewed interest in his work, so she read him and she adopted a lot of techniques from him. She really learned a lot from Saikaku. So that is another thing that you can tell when you read her stories after she read this very important author. She died a celebrity. By the time that she passed away, people were constantly visiting her. She had fans go to her house and stuff like that. And also other authors were, uh, in a literary sense, courting her. They wanted her to collaborate with them. But she was not too keen on, on that idea. She, she just, uh, it, she was always, you know, giving the excuse that she did not feel she was up to the standard of those authors. But I think she just liked to produce her own work and not be involved with other writers and everything that that entails. So I want to give you also some information about her work in the sense of what themes can you find here, what kind of characters, what kind of mode, what characteristics, right? What are the features of her literary work? There is one main challenge that she had, and that is how to write art for money, okay? Because she wanted to make a living as an author. She wanted to live off her writing, but how do you do that in a way that you can still produce something that is worthwhile? She did not want to sell out. She did not want to write trash just so that she could be paid. So that is a challenge that you see throughout her life. And I think when it comes to the themes, the most obvious theme in her work is a moral theme, if you will. And this is it. Basically, she is much about the condemnation of materialism and the cult of success. She believes that this destroys people. And she constantly includes this kind of a theme in her work. But above all, right, if somebody asks me, Jorge, what is the main thing, right? What is the main idea of Ichio Higuchi's work? I would say that she treats particularly the topic, the theme, the subject of disillusionment. Just as, you know, Garcia Marquez said, I only write about solitude, I would think uh, Ichio Higuchi would say something like, I write about disillusionment and how conformity and convention destroy people's desires and their dreams which leads to, you know, a vicious cycle of discontent, basically. What kind of characters does she talk about? Primarily, the dispossessed. So you're going to find in her work uh, misfits, prostitutes, the poor, children, a lot of children in, in her works. She was very good at conveying the world of children. And the good thing about all this is that she writes about these characters with a lot of compassion. So that's another feature that you could say is modern about her work. And here's another one. This characteristic is really modern. Her endings are open. Okay, so she has those ambiguous endings that are the characteristic or the mark of more um, modern type of narrative. And her best stories, finally, I would say uh, they feature a very good or, or a very perceptible command of irony. Okay, but this is not the kind of ir irony that is... Um, you know, basically negative, in a negative sense, because she is able to be ironic and at the same time compassionate towards her characters, which is something that I believe as an author is very difficult to achieve, but she does that 
very well. So I want to give you some information about each one of the stories that are included here and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go in chronological order. I'm not going to spoil any of the stories for you and the reason we go in chronological order is because that is the order in which they are included here in the book. So let's see what we have here. The first two stories that are included in this book are basically lovesick stories and the first one is titled Flowers at dusk. So her first story, we already have a story of unrequited love and this is of course the result of that relationship that I was telling you about with Nakarai. It's basically about a girl who falls in love with her neighbor. They live in adjacent houses and the neighbor is a guy who is completely aloof or unaware. He's one of those people who think, wow, I don't really believe that anybody could be interested in me that way. So we already have a disconnection right there. And even in this early story, you can find an open ending, the type of uh, Ichio Higuchi ending that uh, you find throughout her career. So this is something that was almost natural to her. The heroine's um, situation, once again, is totally autobiographical and it really mirrors her feelings towards Tosui Nagarai, who actually, and this is very interesting, published this work in his literary journal. So I cannot help wondering, you know, whether he realized or not that this was a completely autobiographical story. Maybe he was like the character in the story and did not even realize that. So the second story, which is also about, you know, um, feelings that are not corresponded, is titled A Snowy Day. And it's about a girl who falls in love with her teacher and about the rumors that arise because of that. And this is also, you know, her situation with Nakarai because in that relationship, people began to talk. As soon as somebody thought that maybe there was more to, to them than the mentor-mentee relationship, of course there were rumors and that caused a problem in her life that you can see if you read about her biography. So another autobiographical story, but this one adds a little element that I thought was interesting. In this story, the heroine is looking back on these events. So you have that idea of the story of a memory. So I, I really like uh, that aspect of a snowy day, which you do not find in the first story. It is not a great story, but it really gives you a good idea. Uh, it's an interesting, um, you know, example of a further step in her writing career. Then we have the sound of the koto. This one is also important because it introduces another figure that she liked to write about. I'm going to tell you about that in a second. So it's about a boy who becomes an orphan and a kind of wanderer. Okay, he has no place to stay. He's just wandering around trying to find ways to uh, live, you know, and to survive. And in the second part of the story, he arrives at a secluded house where he sees a woman playing the koto just beautifully. Okay, so just listening to the music and seeing this woman playing just changes the life of this little wanderer forever. So you could say that maybe this, the sound of the koto, is the story of an epiphany in a way. So it's a nice little tale and to me the theme here is the redemptive power of beauty because beauty basically transforms this character. And the type of character that it introduces that I was telling you before is the figure of the waif. Okay, there's this little urchin, right? There are plenty of those throughout her work and this is the first story in which we actually find that. The next one, the fourth story included in the collection is titled Encounters on a Dark night and it is much more sophisticated than the previous stories that I talked about. So if you're looking for like one big step forward, Encounters in a Dark Night is it, okay? Look at the story, the premise is really nice. There's a young man and he is hit by a rickshaw. So an elderly couple decide to take him to the mistress of the house whose name is Oran. So the boy is an orphan, okay, just like the, the guy in the previous story, and he ends up staying with Oran. They develop a really good relationship because Oran has also lost her loved ones, okay, not only her parents, but there's a whole story behind her there too. So this story, uh, the difference between this one and the other ones is not only a difference in the characters that it presents, but there's a deep sense of disillusionment in this story. So this is where you begin to see that dark side of uh, Japan that Ichio Higuchi liked to uh, explore and to portray. I would say there's a lot of pessimism here, even cynicism, okay? 
it's a very good story but uh, it has one main problem that, that I found at least and I feel like towards the end the story just succumbs to melodrama okay it, it's just too much it's too much of, of a dramatic thing towards the end but that said the ending is very good and it is an open ending so you also get that typical uh, Ichio Higuchi type of ending what do we have next we have on the last day of the year okay I really liked this one and actually according to Dan Lee he described this one as the transitional work heralding a mature age in the work of Ichio Higuchi so really important okay because we really see a literary turning point in this story on the last day of the year it is about a servant who is working for a rich and arrogant family and one day she decides to visit her uncle who is sick right so she visits her sick uncle and her family and she realizes that this family her family they really need money okay they're desperate they're in very dire straits and she decides to do something about that now this is one of those stories that I cannot really tell you much about without ruining the reading experience for you so what I'm gonna say is that it displays a really personal a non-conventional concept of justice okay that is the main theme I would say of this story or the main thing that it kind of puts on the table when you compare it to other stories by her and I think when Dan Lee said that this was such an important work you know a transitional work heralding the mature face I think what he meant was that this is one of the first stories by Ichio Higuchi where you can see that signature irony that she had so that's my take on his interpretation of that and the next one is titled troubled waters okay this is the story of a courtesan many of her characters as I said before were the dispossessed and you see that in the figure of the courtesan that is featured in this story and she is obsessed with a client who later went on to get married and he even had a son and here's the thing the guy is obsessed with her too so this story is a really good psychological portrayal of attachment and infatuation you know these obsessions that people can have and how they can destroy them and keep them from being happy right so this one is definitely a tragedy maybe even a melodrama like encounters in a dark night the ending is really good because you do not hear the ending directly from the narrator you hear about what happened or what might have happened because it is also a very ambiguous ending through town gossip so it reminded me of something completely different I was thinking of Juan Carlos Onetti's short story El Infierno Tan Temido Hell Most Feared or something like that in the English translation another story in which you get the ending from what characters are saying to each other so really there's no way for you to know if that is what actually happened and at the end you don't really know what happened so I, I really like that uh, feature that ending of this story because it's typical like this is vintage Ichio Higuchi so that was Traveled Waters and next we have the 13th night so this is about a woman who arrives at her parents house after she has just left her abusive verbally abusive okay husband and her child with the intention of never going back to them again and in this one what you want to look out for is the reaction of her mother and what she says to her and on the other hand the reaction of her father so it's it's a really good commentary on gender and values that's what this uh, story basically provides for us towards the second part in the second half of the story there's a surprise but I think that this surprise that we have is hardly believable okay it's one of those stories where you may think well that is maybe too much of a coincidence so for that reason I would say that the 13th night is just basically a thesis story that condemns marriage for convenience okay it is a really good comment nevertheless on how people sometimes feel trapped by their situation and there's nothing that they can do and they stay in a situation that is far from ideal basically because it's the only thing that they can do and they have to think of other people before they think of themselves and uh, stuff like that so next we have the eighth uh, story that is featured here the one that I believe to be her, her, her masterpiece and that is child's play okay now the original title is Take Kurabe and that means comparing heights okay there was an anime version of this one and it was titled growing up so you know child's play comparing heights uh, growing up this is the kind of title that we have and the original title Takekurabe comes actually directly from a poem in the tales of Ise 
Okay, so uh, Ichiyo Higuchi was not only influenced by these works, she incorporated them, sometimes complete phrases, complete situations from these works into her fiction. This is the story of Midori. She is uh, very young, you know, she's a girl, really, the sister of a prostitute. So she has money because of that. And people know, of course, her situation. And she is caught in the middle between uh, rival street gangs. On the one hand, we have Shota, who is the leader of one of the gangs. He's very charismatic and also very well off. And on the other hand, we have Chokichi, who is basically completely the opposite. He's just very uncouth and totally unattractive. So one of the things that he does in order to get more help in his gang is to enlist the help of a guy by the name of Nobu. Nobu is the son of a priest and he is on the road to becoming a priest himself. So we have a very interesting situation here when it comes to the two gangs and who are the people involved in them. Midori likes Nobu, but she hangs out with Shota's gang. So you can see how she's torn between the two of them. Now Nobu, for his part, he really likes Midori also, but he's not supposed to like her because he is on the road to becoming a priest and also because he belongs to the rival gang. So what he does is he begins to treat her poorly. As a result, she grows resentful towards him. So you have a love-hate relationship right here. This is a story about among other things, the way that conventions keep people apart. So that is what we're seeing right here between these two characters. This story is great for many reasons. Okay, there are many reasons why I call it her masterpiece. One of them is the characterization, which is just amazing for a work from this time period. But also there's an excellent construction of the setting, if you ask me, which is in this case the uh, pleasure quarter, which Ichio Higuchi knew very well because, as I told you before, she and her mother and her sister lived very close by to it. And here's the thing, this is something that Danley points out in the biography section of the book. Her mother, Ichio Higuchi's mother, and her sister were seamstresses. So guess who were some of their best customers? The courtesans, of course. And Ichio Higuchi herself, look at this, she was a writer. So, according to Dan Lee, whenever a courtesan needed a good love letter written, they may have turned to Ichiyo Higuchi. So you can see how it was that she came to learn a lot about this place and also about the people who inhabit it. This story features a lot of attention given to secondary characters. So there are a lot of characters here who appear once, they appear just fleetingly, and after that you don't hear from them anymore. But that really adds to the construction of this pleasure quarter in fiction. It really is a microcosm, and I would say it's even a character in this story, because of the detail that is devoted to describing it and the goings-on and all of that. I really love the conflict here. Think about this. You have the sister of a prostitute and the son of a priest, okay? And they like each other, but they can't show each other that love that they have or that infatuation or whatever it is at this point when we meet them. It just never develops into anything because of this situation right here. And there's a wonderful contrast right there. You have on the one hand the brothel and on the other hand the temple. And in this story at least, they are very similar because they are both businesses. So that's another thing I like about Child's Play, that it really allowed Ichiyo Higuchi to basically explore that money factor, okay? The finance and all of that. That is always uh, an element of her stories, but you see it very clearly in this one right here. So it's a subtle story, it is objective, it is also a, a coming-of-age story, which is something that I personally I like very much, and it is definitely a mature work when you compare it to the others. So that's why I say that. This was my favorite from the collection. And the last story that we have here is Separate Ways. This is a story about two characters who meet briefly and the connection is established. But in fact, these characters are worlds apart. Did you get the reference there? Separate Ways, Worlds Apart? I just had to throw that in there. This is a story about disillusionment. It's a story about disappointment and the loss of innocence. We have two characters for the most part, we have a seamstress who moves into town and the son of the landlord, 
that she has, who also works at the umbrella shop. So this is a kid who's like 16 years old, but he looks as if he were 11 or 12. He's also very short in stature, so people are constantly making fun of him. So you have once again a misfit type of character, somebody that nobody likes. They become like brother and sister, and he is really proud of their relationship because it basically just brings a little bit of color into his ordinary life. So you can understand why he would be so, you know, amazed by this relationship that he has with this older woman. But then everything changes all of a sudden, okay? This is a typical situation in Ichiyo Higuchi's works and I can't tell you much about it because I don't want to ruin the experience for you. This is one of the shortest stories in the collection. It's about eight pages long, but it's amazing all that she achieves in that short, you know, in that brief uh, space, in that brief writing space, we could say. This is a condemnation of materialism, but if you look at it from another perspective, from the perspective of another character, I'm trying not to give anything away here, it is also a story about values, about how you can stay true to your principles even in the most difficult conditions, how there are people who will never sell out, they will never betray their values and their principles, no matter what. So it depends on whose perspective you're looking at here. Uh, Dan Lee says that uh, Separate Ways is Ichiyo Higuchi's masterpiece. Do I agree with that? That's a very good question, okay? I think that Child's Play is a little bit richer, okay? Of course it's longer, we're talking about more than 30 pages, so some people call it a novella. I don't think it's a novella, I think it's more of a short story, but I guess it depends on what day I'm reading it. Another day I may think, oh yeah, this is actually a novella. It, it's really complex and we're not going to go into that here. But um, even though I feel like that child's play is richer, I would say Separate Ways is subtler. It is more understated. And we value that as readers sometimes. So if you're looking for understatement, if you're looking for a polished work, a polished story, then you know you may think that maybe Separate Ways is her masterpiece. I would say you know either of these stories, if you read them, one of them it's is her masterpiece. Okay, they're equal in quality. So. One of them is the best story that she ever wrote. I'm partial to Child's Play, but Separate Ways has a lot going for it also. Bottom line, I love Ichiyo Higuchi. I just want to end the video right there with that statement, okay? But, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit more than that. Her life and her work were, uh, unfortunately, you know, her life and her career were just uh, very brief. I think that if she had lived a longer time and she had written more, we would be reading her as much as we read Natsume Soseki. Okay, I think she would have been that important. Her first stories in particular, if you look at them, they're not perfect. Okay, you can tell that this is basically, they're quite rough. Okay, but her mature work really deserves a lot of recognition, a lot more recognition than she gets. So I would say at least uh, try to find a copy of Child's Play and Separate Ways. Read one of those. And if you do decide to get the book, which I highly recommend, by the way, what I would do is this. Read the biography. Uh, part, which is the one that comes first, and when you see that the author uh, mentions one of the stories, go to the back part and read that story before the story is digested for you, before you get the chance to experience it. That's how I did it. You know, I just read the biography and whenever he was going into analysis of one of the stories, I went to the back. So I guess I was reading it the way you read Hopscotch, okay, Cortázar's Rachuela. Uh, that's kind of what I did, and I had a, an amazing experience because her life is really important in terms of her, you know, in relation to her work. That is always the case, of course. What I'm saying really, you know, uh, applies to so many authors. But in this case, I think uh, you get a much richer experience of her work if you're also aware of what was going on in her life because there is such a close relationship between them. You could also say that, in a way, this or much of what is included in this book could be considered to be auto-fiction. So it's, you know, that kind of closeness between life and art. Do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? I hope you enjoyed this video. Those are my two cents on the life and work of Ichio Higuchi, an amazing Japanese author. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.